Morning students, uh, this is now the live stream of uh, economics of innovation. Some of you are already here uh, on WebEx. I welcome you to the course on economics of regulation. My name is Georg Götz. You should also see me on a small webcam here. Probably you have seen me before. Uh, that's how I look. Uh, in a little bit bigger size. Uh, this is uh, interesting times, uh, demanding times, uh, and uh, we will have this experiment with the lecture being given being given uh, online, streamed via YouTube. Uh, I apologize just for any problems we might have. Oh, just uh, could you give some one of you uh, give me uh, some indication that you are able to to hear me and th that the stream uh, works? That would be great if you just send me, send me uh, give me either a hand uh, or or better send a message in the in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah, welcome, and uh, we are looking forward to an interesting uh, course, I think. Uh, I just want to give you a brief overview of the course uh, and then uh, discuss the administrative uh, and organizational details of the course. First of all, why should you take this course? Actually, of course, this is a very interest, going to be a very interesting course. You will get up-to-date theory combined with relevant applications and uh, empirics. Uh, this is really a front of the research uh, theory. We combine information economics and mechanism design. We cover, imp we cover uh, important industries and we will uh, or you will learn something which gives you interesting job perspectives uh, just to uh, show you a few cases of course uh, what will be very important uh, in all of we are discussing here is uh, what the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Network Agency does this is a German regulator for railways for uh, electricity and gas for uh, telecoms for postal service and so on uh, and uh, I think uh, this is a, obviously a, a potential employer uh, I have at my chair a long-standing uh, collaboration with Deutsche Bahn uh, several of our graduates went and work for went to Deutsche Bahn and work for Deutsche Bahn and they uh, in the last 10 or 12 years Deutsche Bahn uh, financed uh, some some kind of dissertation grants so we always have interesting research projects some of my graduates work at EMBW uh, uh, a German uh, electricity and, and or energy company uh, which is now divided in separate uh, units but uh, they work there and you see here from this uh, 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 ad that even in Gießen you might get uh, uh, or might be able to get a, a, a job uh, at uh, Stadtwerke Gießen where you also might do something like uh, what, what is required or what, what is taught in this course. Okay, uh, that's just for the beginning. I just want to give you... Uh, oh. I almost forgot this slide here. You see that uh, this is a, a recent slide from the uh, UK, from the British uh, energy uh, regulator, uh, and they had what or they presented what is called an RIIO model. Uh, this is uh, after 20 years of, of regulatory practice, they uh, or practice they changed their their uh, uh, model slightly and now have a model which is called revenue incentives and innovation and outputs and it's a performance based framework to set price controls in these network industries and uh, what is interesting about this slide is it gives you already an indication what these network industries are you see that there is electricity uh, 
not so much more here. Network comp because this is uh, the regulator for gas and electricity. And the point is we, we already give a first definition of these network companies. Network companies are monopoly businesses. You don't normally get to choose which one you use. Uh, so Ofcom or Ofgem sets a price controls. A seating on the mount companies can earn from change charges to use the networks. So w what we will do, uh, first of all, I will give you in the remainder of, of today's lecture uh, introduction in what network ac uh, uh, industries actually are. We are talking about the postal uh, sector, the railways, telecoms, uh, uh, electricity companies, gas companies, all uh, these infrastructures or what is called utilities where networks, where uh, huge infrastructures, where transmission lines and grids matter. Uh, in order to understand all the things we we are doing in this course, we, uh, I will first of all give you a, a reminder or a refresh of what you learned in, the, in your undergraduate microeconomic studies where we use into the, to the, to the two market structures, perfect competition and monopoly as a benchmark. Uh, then I will uh, also give you another kind of... Uh, uh, then I will also uh, give you uh, some kind of... Uh, introduction into uh, more sophisticated cost concepts. Of course, you know about uh, production functions, you know about uh, uh, cost functions. We will go into much more detail in terms of, uh, of uh, economies of scale, economies of scope, what are multi-product firms and so on. Uh, next point will be contestable markets uh, in particular and also war of attrition. War of attrition is where you get price wars, a concept I'm going to detail uh, to, to describe later in detail. Contestable markets are a market structure which are just something like a generalist uh, Bertrand competition where even though you have a monopoly in the market, the monopoly cannot charge a price above uh, average costs because potential competition is so important. Uh, unfortunately, in most real world uh, industries, we don't have contestable markets. And if we have these kind of natural monopolies here, if you have such an infrastructure, uh, we typically have an eff efficiency reason for, for regulation because monopolists typically uh, charge too high prices. We will discuss that in chapter five. Okay, so if we want to uh, regulate or if we know that we need to regulate uh, our so-called utilities, our natural monopolies, when the question is how, uh, the first uh, scenario we look into is into that of a fully informed regulator. Okay, our regulator is benevolent, so he, he or she wants to maximize uh, social welfare and uh, also is omniscient, so knows everything. And uh, in that scenario, uh, we, you will learn about the concept which is ramsey Botter pricing. The point here is, of course, all of you know if you have uh, a so-called natural monopoly, which is typi uh, ty uh, typically a situation where you have uh, uh, decreasing average cost, it would be optimal to have price equal marginal cost and pay some some lump sum uh, some lump sum subsidy to the to the uh, uh, respective company. Unfortunately, uh, governments don't have so much money, and therefore you often have uh, a so-called uh, break-even pricing, uh, and uh, you will learn that Ramsey pricing, uh, Ramsey Botter pricing is some instrument. Very often you don't have full information and you get, uh, in a sense, very traditional kind of regulation, which is cost of service regulation, something we have in German water, in the German water sector, where just the company says what its costs are, and it's then allowed to charge prices to the service so that the 
these costs or just cover that they get to some rate of return. Uh, you might imagine that this runs into trouble if your allowed rate of return uh, or, or leads to trouble if your allowed rate of return like in say uh, electricity regulation is 6% because uh, if you earn uh, f f uh, 0% uh, if you put it on your savings account and if you earn 6% if you uh, do uh, electricity uh, uh, investment in your electricity grid you have an incentive perhaps to overinvest in, in capital and make too much investment. That's actually what Average and Johnson already showed in the early 60s in a famous paper. So we will also discuss that. After that, we will move on to what is called incentive regulation. And here we really enter modern territory uh, in terms of, of, of economic uh, theory and economic modeling. Uh, the most important thing is then what happens if we have asymmetric uh, information. The benchmark under complete information is pretty, pretty straightforward and, and uh, and uh, similar to what we did in, in, in chapter six. Uh, but then we move on to the modern topics of adverse selection and, and moral hazard, topics which also uh, are important in, in many other sectors like the finance industries, uh, like in, in, uh, in, 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 in uh, discussions of how you um, incentivize your managers. Here the point is that we have asymmetric information and the regulator as a principle does not know, in the case of adverse selection for instance, whether the costs of the, of the regulated company are high or low and it somehow must send, uh, set an incentive contract. And we will learn in that, uh, in that uh, chapter how that works. Another instance of this um, asymmetric information problem is so-called moral hazard uh, where you don't know uh, why costs of a company are high. Are they high because the management didn't work hard or are they high because there was some adverse shock? Okay, uh, further on we will move on and you will see some interesting examples with Yostic uh, competition and monopoly franchises where you see how you can introduce competition in cases in which you have, for instance, like in the German electricity sector, 800 different municipal electricity companies, which are all local monopolies. And Yostic competition uh, gives you an example how... Uh, you can introduce competition among that so that they are forced uh, to set prices uh, almost like under perfect competition. Okay, uh, then practical policies will cover a very important uh, topic of the last, say, 25 years in, in, in regulation, namely so-called price cap regulation. You, we will learn about tariff pass cap regulation and so on. These are so-called uh, high... Uh, these are so-called uh, high-powered incentives. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the point is, and there we get to uh, the recent discussion of uh, whether we should deregulate uh, uh, these industries or not. Uh, the point in, in, in chapter 13 is uh, if you compare or if you discuss or if you think about regulating a certain industry, the, the point is that uh, you have to discuss uh, of course, you have to compare, if you compare the unregulated situation with the regulated situation, you have to compare uh, 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 unregulated situation, which is less than perfect, with a regulated situation uh, where regulation is also not perfect. And that's, uh, uh, you will see that, uh, uh, or what the important uh, variables here when we decide about whether we would have to, uh, to or whether we want to have regulation or whether we want to have an unregulated situation. Here, this is, for instance, relevant in the telecom sector, uh, where you might think, do we need to regulate Deutsche Telekom at all, given that Deutsche Telekom faces competition, for instance, by by Vodafone uh, in and, and uh, formerly uh, Unity Media, uh, who run 
fixed line internet services via the, the, uh, the TV cable uh, or faces also competition in the mobile telecom sector. Uh, important here also in the telecom sector is what we have here, entry barriers and entry uh, 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 assistance. In this, uh, in this uh, part, we will discuss uh, we will discuss what is called access uh, regulation. Uh, the, the last two chapters, chapter 14 and 15, uh, we probably won't cover. Chapter 14 is something, network effects, uh, network interconnection, network effects, network externality, standardization, and so on. This is uh, what I cover in the economics of uh, innovation course. In more detail, we we'll also discuss, uh, for instance, two-sided markets. Uh, the chapter 15, network uh, interconnection and two-way access pricing is very interesting, partic interesting in particular uh, when it comes to, say, for instance, mobile telecoms uh, networks. Uh, but the problem is this is uh, a very advanced topics and a topic uh, we we uh, probably uh, will uh, or is more uh, for, a, for a, uh, a PhD course than for, for this course. Okay, uh, I need a small break now, uh, having talked 15 minutes. Uh, and uh, so we could uh, discuss now or just check whether uh, whether we or whether you have any questions. Uh, for this purpose, I just uh, uh, give you uh, the, 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 the other slide uh, here. Uh, and with this other slide, the, these, uh, st the starting slide, uh, we had, and if we have this slide, uh, the 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 uh, there will be no tone, no audio on YouTube, so you can ask questions, and you won't be on uh, the YouTube stream. Okay, after this uh, break, we I and before I move on with a further discussion of the of the introduction. Uh, here I, I have to find uh, the respective window here. Uh, I want to give you some overview of some, some administrative uh, details here. Uh, and therefore all of you obviously managed to, to register for the course in, in StudIP, in our uh, JLU Intra uh, net. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here and uh, you wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have uh, the respective, uh, the respective uh, code for uh, the YouTube stream and for WebEx. Uh, what you see here in, uh, in Uh, the 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 stud IP is that you get a lot of information here. Uh, in particular, I have here the German version. In English, it will be files and so on. Uh, in in uh, the folder the time, which means files, uh, you get the lecture slides and you get the assignments. So uh, what you could already download or the, the PDF of the PowerPoint slides I present today. Uh, what you also can download in the assignments part is the assignment uh, we will have uh, next week. I move back to that uh, in a minute and explain that in more detail. Uh, before I do that, I go to the course description. Hopefully, uh, you already read that. Uh, I pretty much already told you what this course is about. It's about network industries like electricity, gas, water supply, and so on. Uh, I already gave you an overview of the course contents. Uh, the important point is, uh, in terms of the literature you might uh, or uh, I'm relying on, there is no textbook or something like that for this course. Uh, what I'm relying on here is, uh, oops, it was so wrong, uh, is, is so-called handbook articles. Uh, here is an article by Porchosko, Regulation of Natural Monopolies. It has been published uh, in the handbook of, of law and economics. And here you already get the direct link both to the working paper 
and uh, to the uh, L, uh, to the to the journal article. Uh, and if you use uh, the EZ uh, EC proxy, uh, which you should really install on your internet browser, it works only with Chrome. It doesn't work, I think, with Edge. Uh, yet, then you can directly download that. Uh, the other set of uh, Handbook articles uh, and articles is uh, uh, two articles by Mark Armstrong and David Zepping. And so the paper by Chosco is required reading because, uh, as you will see if you go through that article, uh, I pretty much follow that article. And uh, here Mark Armstrong uh, and, and David Zepping in particular is relevant for the part on incentive regulation and asymmetric information, in particular adverse selection. Uh, and, and moral hazard. Again, this is also article in the handbook of industrial organization. And here you also have the link to uh, this article. There's another paper, uh, uh, a survey published in the, in the uh, Journal of Economic Literature called Regulation, Competition and Liberalization. And, uh, and here Just confused. Uh, and, and here uh, you get in particular insights on how to introduce uh, competition to formally regulated uh, industries. There are also textbooks. However, this textbook by, by Kip Viscusi, Joe Herring, and David Sapping, even though it's very interesting, uh, it has a, a dedicated US focus and a lot of institutional details about US industries. Uh, and it's uh, more at the undergraduate level. There's also a German textbook, uh, Bormann Finsinger, Markt und Regulierung, which, uh, which uh, will, I will also turn to for certain certain topics uh, yeah so you might use that also as a reference text uh, in particular if you write a thesis in that topic david newbury's text is very uh, good uh, most of the theory uh, i use is based on industrial organization and here i gave you as a, rec a reference uh, the pepper richard norman text which i use very much in the industrial organization course i give in the uh, winter term uh, importantly uh, it is important that uh, this is a, a master level course uh, and uh, therefore i i uh, Expect that you know your inter uh, the, the, the microeconomics content from the undergraduate studies. If you have problems, if you want to look up uh, something, uh, you uh, should uh, go to your microeconomics textbook. Might be Pindy Grubenfeld, might be might be be variants. Uh, undergraduate microeconomic text. Uh, it, you might also use this text by Press McAfee, which is freely available. Okay, uh, that was it about uh, the, the, the literature I'm going to use. Uh, here uh, under Ablauf, uh, at, uh, under, so, so the, here the topic Ablauf plan uh, means schedule here. This is a pre preliminary uh, schedule of the course. Of course, uh, it will change because we are missing one one week, so this is really a preliminary. You see today uh, we start with the introduction and hopefully we also, uh, we also, or perhaps we also get to the first parts of the second chapter uh, dealing with perfect competition uh, and, and monopoly and then we will cover technology and cost. And here, what, what is important here, uh, this course consists of lectures and of a tutorial class. Uh, typically, the lecture will be on Thursday, the tutorial class uh, will be on Tuesday, apart from this week, because we uh, start with the lecture, of course. Uh, and then uh, uh, we have assignments pretty much every week, and I will discuss what that means uh, in a minute here. You just get the overview, as I told you, uh, this is uh, preliminary. Okay, this is preliminary uh, and, uh, and, and subject uh, to change. Okay. So uh, next uh, point I want to discuss uh, is the assignments. Uh, of course, you all of you want to get uh, credits for the course. 
and here uh, and, and and that's what I'm going to show you today. Hopefully, or m many of you perhaps, or hopefully have have uh, already downloaded uh, this uh, this uh, file. Here again, you get uh, the the syllabus of the course, and you get the the, the required reading. What I gave you previously, I don't know whether you can whether this is legible on 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 the YouTube, but anyway, so you you have it anyway. Uh, the uh, what I already told you that uh, that class time and class time here also means virtual class time. Uh, it's Thursday eight to ten, of course, and it's uh, not on on uh, on uh, in 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 lecture room. Here's a few and twenty hour lecture hall twenty four, uh, but it's but it's uh, oh, I always have to check here because someone enters the the webex. Uh, it, it's on webex and on YouTube. Uh, the exercise class will be on Tuesday at the, at the, the at, uh, from eight to ten. And uh, what is interesting, I already sent you. Uh, 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 code to enter the Microsoft Teams uh, class. Uh, please uh, do all register to Microsoft Teams. Uh, how you can do that? Uh, we just just might uh, move back uh, to to the Stud IP. I gave here this uh, you this overview. I forgot uh, just here uh, here uh, in in the course. Uh, you, you got this announcement how uh, you might uh, sign up for uh, for where is it here please log into office 365 and uh, and install Microsoft teams because there will be uh, what is called a course uh, notebook and uh, we will be able to uh, in a sense, Together uh, prepare these assignments and discuss them in class. Uh, I, I don't know whether we uh, can use uh, Microsoft uh, Teams or whether we have to use WebEx. Any case, uh, we can share uh, this OneNote uh, notebook, and so we can jointly discuss uh, the problems. How do these problems look like? Now that's what you see in the assignment. Uh, currently, of course, you're interested in how you uh, earn your your credits. Uh, that's uh, I increase it a little bit so that you certainly can can see it. In order to earn your your credits, also uh, in case there are any questions. Uh, just uh, use the chat function in, in WebEx, okay? I see here on WebEx uh, one, one, one or, two, or, or two hands. I don't know whether that means that you want to say something uh, or, or you just forgot to, to put down again. So uh, just uh, send me something, uh, a message in, in the chat. Okay, uh, I will get back and I will uh, give you. Oh, I, I'm, I went back to the, the, the course assignment here. So, here, how do you get uh, your, your, your credits? First of all, there will be a final exam whenever we will be able to, to do that, and the final exam makes up 85% of uh, the total mark. Uh, and uh, we also will have uh, this tutorial class uh, and uh, in order to earn credits here uh, you should submit these assignments here. So this is assignment one. Uh, you see here uh, that uh, assignment one consists of, of, uh, of problems uh, which are typically mathematical or formal, and some once in a while they also uh, to be answered verbally. And here is uh, that you should prepare these problems uh, and 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 hand it in, submit them, and uh, that will be 
So there will be 12 or 13 problems and uh, you can get uh, if, uh, at most 10 points for that. Uh, so if you hand in uh, 10 assignments, you will uh, add 10 points. Given that you pause each assignment, in order to pause, I don't uh, require or, or, or expect you to provide uh, perfect uh, solutions uh, of, of these problems. Uh, what, what I uh, expect you is just uh, to give you uh, that you, you, you just uh, looked into that and, and show uh, that you really worked on that uh, and uh, that, that you try to solve it. Of course, I do not expect that you can already solve it perfectly because that's otherwise we wouldn't need to have the tutorial class. Okay, so if I see that you tried uh, to solve it and had problems, uh, uh, no problems, uh, it's much more of a problem if you present, uh, of course, uh, 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 some solution. Colleagues of you have uh, uh, already produced uh, last year or two years ago because uh, some of our questions or our problem sets will be uh, the same as, as in the previous semesters uh, or in the previous years. Uh, you don't learn much uh, by doing that. Uh, and uh, I get the expression that you know everything anyway, so uh, we will have a tough time in, in the tutorial uh, class. Okay, that's about this. So this was uh, the assignments. Okay, the assignments, uh, of course, you have to hand them in uh, and to send it via email. Uh, to, to the assignment's email address with a certain uh, uh, subject. Uh, you, you should do that in the very beginning anyway. Uh, the point is I don't expect you uh, to, that every one of you uh, uh, produces a, a, a solution on his, on his or her own, uh, but I expect you to form working groups of say three to five people, at most five, uh, and uh, you should jointly uh, produce uh, one set of solutions and then submit it. The point is, of course, uh, collaboration. Uh, oh. uh, I just got, thank you, Harun, for this question. I got uh, just uh, the question, when do we get the instruction for building the work groups? That's what I'm just talking about, okay? Uh, the, 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 the point is, of course, uh, that uh, it's, it's uh, not so easy in these times to cooperate, but it is easy, actually, once you have Microsoft Teams, because once you have Microsoft Teams, you might be able to set up uh, your own uh, uh, small team and uh, as you will see once you have this uh, notebook I will assign or uh, once you have once you have uh, registered for uh, or, or to to Microsoft Teams I will send you these assignments uh, in your uh, specific student uh, area and and you could uh, you could uh, uh, also uh, solve that in Teams, and I will have access to it. We will check that uh, next week, uh, or already Thursday. Just let's see how it works. Uh, and then uh, uh, yeah, you can form these teams uh, on Microsoft Teams. You can form these small working groups. Uh, if you uh, want me, uh, I might just uh, uh, actually... Uh, form teams or working groups, the easiest way would then be just uh, to go to, to, to uh, say, uh, to uh, the stud IP. Uh, I don't want to, to show that right now, the list of participants. And uh, if, you, uh, if you do not know whom you want to join, uh, we might just form some groups uh, on alphabetical order or something like that. Uh, perhaps you give me feedback on, on Thursday, whether you have been able. You might as well uh, use uh, the, the forum uh, in, uh, in, in, in the stud IP. Oh, I just uh, 
I didn't uh, tell you that, okay? Here, uh, as I see, no one uh, by now entered anything uh, on the pin wand, on the pin board. There is also a forum and you might uh, just uh, discuss here, enter new category, uh, working groups, uh, back to, to the assignments. Okay, so uh, for the first week, please submit uh, the assignments via email. Uh, then uh, perhaps we can do it solely in, in Teams. I'm uh, really, uh, uh, I'm really very fond of Teams because uh, it offers amazing opportunities. And what you see here on the course requirement, you have this 85% of the final exam. You have this 10% uh, uh, by the assignments, which you also can submit in an old-fashioned way by, by uh, submitting them via email. And uh, finally, there is this uh, participation and, and uh, presentation. And actually, I hope that we can do that, and we means you, uh, can do that in, in Microsoft Teams. So you present uh, your solutions, and then uh, you, uh, you uh, present them in, in Microsoft Teams. Uh, you can do, uh, you can write on a white, whiteboard and uh, we can have uh, uh, a discussion here. After we discuss these organizational details uh, and, and uh, administrative things and uh, hopefully uh, it's clear now how you will earn uh, your, uh, your credit uh, and how that works with the assignments. We will check that on Microsoft Teams. But now I just want to move on with my uh, with my introduction. Okay, uh, pretty much uh, what I did some some uh, ten minutes ago. Uh, this was uh, this content page was was something like an elevator pitch. I gave you in five minutes the content of the whole course, and uh, if you know all these things at the end of the course, I'm really happy. Okay, so what are the topics? So in some more details, uh, what should be clear by now, it's about uh, your natural monopolies. Uh, in, in, in next lecture or in two lectures, you will know why I put that in quotation marks here. Uh, we use typically a technological definition of natural monopolies uh, and relate that to a cost concept called subadditivity. But anyway, these natural monopolies are the typical, what is in US called utilities. These are the gas companies, the electricity companies, the telecoms, and so on. And uh, what we uh, typically had, or in, 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 in continental Europe for more than 100 years had, was uh, state-owned companies, government uh, monopolies, uh, like uh, Deutsche Bundespost, like Deutsche Bundesbahn, and so on, or, or British Rail, etc., all government-owned uh, uh, companies. Uh, in the US, we have a long tradition of, of regulation in these industries where you had private companies like uh, AT&T, which was a telecom company, which was regulated by some, some state or, or federal or regulatory authorities. So this is one part of, of regulation. Uh, the other part uh, of regulation is in the fields of product sa safety, health and environmental standards in the field of so-called social regulation. We won't deal with social regulation. This is a different topic, uh, environmental standards, how you uh, make sure that uh, that uh, cars don't too pollute too much, that factories don't pollute too much. Uh, in, in times of corona, of course, health is also important, uh, 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 very important uh, uh, dimension where you make sure that workplaces are safe and so on. In terms of product safety, it's also clear that uh, if you go to a restaurant, you rather want to make sure that you're not uh, somehow poisoned uh, or that your car drives safely. Uh, that's different topics we won't deal with here. Uh, we will deal with the, with the regulation of, of uh, uh, network industries. And uh, here we have, uh, in this topic, we have a lot of uh, overlap 
with antitrust policy. What does antitrust policy do? Yeah, antitrust policy deals with large companies and a potential abuse of uh, a dominant position. And of course, these utilities typically have a dominant position, but they are so uh, dominant that uh, uh, regulators or politicians think that antitrust policy, which typically works ex post, is not sufficient so that you need ex ante what is called sector-specific uh, regulation uh, because it's clear that they have a dominant position and could easily abuse it uh, by charging too high prices. Nevertheless, in Germany, for instance, in, 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 in the water industry, which is uh, basically uh, on, on, on a works uh, basically on a municipal level, uh, we don't have a regulator. So uh, federal network agency, uh, Bundesnetzagentur, is not responsible for water. Uh, there you have some oversight from the Regierungspräsidium, uh, which I don't know how you would call that in, 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 in English. It's just a level above the county. And... Uh, they have an oversight, but this is a very minor, uh, largely formal oversight where we just check whether all the expenses these water companies uh, really uh, claimed they actually had. But of course, that doesn't give you a strong incentive to 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 reduce prices. And uh, what we have uh, seen in the water industry, for instance, that there have been several uh, cases run by the Federal Cartel Office, the Bundeskartellamt, uh, claiming that uh, these water companies charged too high prices and that was an abuse of a dominant position. Actually, uh, this, there was the most famous case concerns Wetzlar, the ENVAC, the, the, the Wetzlar water company. Uh, and here you see that antitrust authorities might also act in a sense as uh, regulators. Uh, in, in terms of uh, all these uh, introduction in regulation, I just want to show you something, okay, as I'm here, I give you uh, the full picture and what I want to, to show you right now is uh, here, uh, in terms of regulation, I just want to, 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 many, uh, to, to mention uh, Jean Thiroux's book Economics for the uh, common good. Uh, uh, Jean Tirol uh, is Nobel laureate and his topic really was uh, industrial organization and regulation. And he has, I don't know, I think, uh, oh, the problem is you cannot get to the library right now, but he has a very full introduction, a very wonderful introductory chapter, perhaps I put it uh, uh, in the stud IP, uh, on, on uh, called sector regulation which gives you a, a, a wonderful overview. I don't know whether you can read it, but I will put it on the internet, uh, on, or, on a student IP. And uh, the next, uh, an, another uh, interesting uh, source is the book by Andrzej Schleifer, uh, The Failure of Judges and the Rise of Regulators. Uh, as you see in, in the notes uh, uh, of this chapter, uh, here uh, in, in, in the introductory chapter on, on pages one uh, to six, uh, Andre Schleifer provides a very nice overview of what social regulation is about, but also about theories of regulation. And here there are already uh, mentioned two theories of regulation, uh, namely the positive theory of regulation and the, the, the normative uh, theory of regulation. Uh, what is, in a sense, most the, the standard theory of regulation is the normative theory of regulation. Uh, this has the standard kind of, of normative approach to economics. Uh, suppose you have a regulator or, or some, some, some social planner, and the question is what and how should regulation look like? Okay, so you, you, you find some, some market failures and then you ask how can you solve this problem and maximize uh, social welfare. This would be the normative uh, theory of regulation. What would a benevolent regulator do who aims to maximize social welfare? The problem might be, of course, that this regulator has limited information and limited commitment power. I will get back to that. Uh, but that's uh, problems to solve. 
Uh, the problem or the point uh, the positive theory made is that uh, many uh, regulations we see in the real world are probably not the outcome of such a, such a process uh, you would uh, 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 equate with this normative theory of regulation. We have many specific regulations uh, where it's not clear why we have them apart from some lobbying interests. For instance, why do we regulate uh, the, the taxi business in, in a way we do it? Why, uh, or the, why, do we, 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 why do we not allow Uber to access the market? Why we, do we have certain entry regulations and so on? Uh, uh, here we have uh, or, or what the positive theory of regulation uh, does, it uh, explains some regulations uh, based on the supply and demand for regulation. Supply of uh, regulation, of course, would be uh, the politicians uh, who might be willing to uh, to somehow cater to what their constituents want, uh, and the demand for regulation, of course, comes from 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 stakeholders in industries who think it's better to have entry barriers or something like that. We get back uh, to that uh, uh, later on. Okay. Oh, where I'm here. Yeah. So uh, what what I just told you were about the uh, or the standard uh, kind of regulation of natural monopolies. This is what regulators have done for uh, at least in the U.S. for about 100 years or more than 100 years. Uh, in in Europe, we had this state-owned uh, we had these state-owned monopolies. Uh, the question is and. Uh, you're probably too young uh, to know that uh, some some 25 years ago or even 30 years uh, in the mid 80s or 35 years uh, in the mid 80s uh, the united kingdom started to to uh, privatize and liberalize certain network industries starting with with the telecoms industry british uh, telecom was was liberalized and the question is when uh, if you want to uh, to privatize former state or monopolies and to de deregulate these markets, uh, you want to establish effective competition in that market because, of course, what is worse than a government, what is certainly worse than a government monopoly, it's a private monopoly which is unregulated. And the question is then how to, to regulate uh, liberalized uh, sectors. Okay? Uh, that's that's what what uh, all this is about. The question is then what organizational structure to choose for integrated state-owned monopolists. I will get back to that in a minute. Uh, I already managed uh, uh, the the relation between ex ante uh, sector-specific regulation, what uh, what the Bundesnetzagentur, the Federal Network Agency does, and the general antitrust policy, what uh, the Federal Cartel Office, the Bundeskartellamt, does. Uh, this, uh, just to give you an example, the question is, do we really need to regulate Deutsche Telekom anymore? Uh, there is still access regulation, and uh, if you see this one and one United Internet uh, uh, advertisements on the network where they say you can DSL get for DSL Internet access for 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 say nine euro ninety five, uh, the product they sell uh, is is a product we buy wholesale from 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 Deutsche Telekom uh, based on on uh, regulated access tariffs. Okay, the question is, do we need that? Given that uh, we have other competition of telecoms by say uh, the, the 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 TV cable from uh, Wood, uh, Vodafone. Okay. And the other question, of course, here, uh, I will get back to that at some length uh, again also. Uh, another point would be how do we deal with asymmetric uh, distribution of information? The point being here that the regulated company, of course, knows more about uh, the cost uh, it has and about the demand it faces than a regulator. Again, a topic I will go into a lot of detail. Uh, then. Uh, how to share risk in public procurement? Uh, that's that's another topic uh, which is related to principal agent problems. We we touch uh, that briefly. The problem is if you think of of large scale uh, public projects like the Elbe Philharmonie, like the Berlin Airport, and so on. What is a common feature of these 
uh, of, of all of these projects, uh, uh, the, or Stuttgart 21, so the, uh, the, the railway station in Stuttgart, so the early projected costs are, say, 1 billion, and it turns out that the real costs have been 10 billion. Who, sh uh, who uh, should, uh, should pay for that risk for this cost increase? Should it be uh, the, 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 the public, uh, the, the, the uh, the, the, the state who, who really procured their project or should it be the companies uh, who built the project? Uh, of course, uh, what you might easily see, of course, you would uh, be tempted to say, okay, uh, we tell them to, to build it uh, for at a cost of one billion, so uh, they have to cover any higher costs. But uh, if you make such a contract, you will easily see if there is a high risk, they wouldn't, uh, they would never find companies willing to, uh, to build that project. Okay, and another point is, uh, this is very much related uh, to the last point, how to maintain incentives to invest under regulation. If you have a price regulation, uh, you will see price cap regulation has a tendency that companies reduce their, their quality and do not want to invest. Uh, if you need to have a lot of investment, for instance, if uh, in, uh, like in the German electricity sector, uh, where uh, we need uh, many new grids because we now get uh, wind power from from the North Sea or the Baltic Sea uh, and we need this power in, in, in southern Germany. So we need to build a lot of, of, of uh, transmission, uh, high voltage transmission grids. Uh, so how do we uh, incentivize this? Okay, so these are the next questions or, or the questions we are going uh, to to address now here's some 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 uh, well I, I guess I could make a short uh, break here uh, as well there was uh, just uh, one question concerning uh, the, uh, the the tutorial class is the tutorial class sufficient to be able to solve the assignments uh, hopefully not hopefully you consider my uh, lecture uh, important as well. Uh, of course, in the tutorial class, we will solve the uh, assignments, uh, but uh, uh, and if you can do it without the lecture, of course, the lecture will be uh, will be recorded and you can you you can view it later on as well. But uh, you can only ask, of course, questions during the, le uh, the, the, the lecture, and so. Uh, hopefully you nevertheless uh, nevertheless uh, participate in the lecture. I don't know whether this answered the, the, the question, but uh, we might get back to that. Okay, uh, so now but uh, back to 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 uh, the the lecture slides. Here the importance of network industries. I just wanted to give you some indication. Here you see that. Uh, the sectors we are talking about make up about 10% of GDP, of gross value added. Okay, uh, you see communication services, energy, transport, storage, uh, where transport storage also includes or, or includes rail transport, maritime transport, road transport, and air transport. You see that's also regulated area because you have regulation of airports, you have public provision of roads and highways, and railways are also uh, to a large degree financed by, by public subsidies and uh, railway access is also regulated. Okay, And you see it's important in many uh, countries. I have a similar slide here. What you see here in terms of employment, uh, of course, transport is the most important part because you have so many truck drivers. Uh, and uh, But the other point, what you see is that the share in terms of employment is lower than the term uh, the, the the share it's about six uh, percent or so with some some exceptions uh, the share in terms of employment is lower than the share in terms of of value added that just means that these are capital intensive industries and apart from say the trucking business if you think of telecoms if you think of of electricity and gas companies they are typically paying well uh, good pay uh, good wages uh, here, uh, a slightly different uh, 
view on its importance, uh, I pretty much put that up because here you have in some detail of, uh, 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 or, or some more detailed account of the different parts like communication inclusive po uh, postal services is about 2% uh, of GDP, you have here electricity and gas, also about 2%. Uh, you have water, which, for instance, Germany is not regulated by the Fed Federal Network Agency, as I told you, and is basically municipal. You have urban transport, you have railways, you have air transport. Okay. Uh, Again, this is another uh, way. It's it's hard to come up with with uh, good uh, good uh, uh, statistical overviews of this sector. But again, here you have about this nine percent share in GDP uh, on uh, the on European average in electricity, gas, water supply, transport, storage, and so on. Uh, and you have as uh, this uh, slightly lower share. Uh, in employment that tells you that these are capital intensive industries compared to the whole uh, industry uh, or to the whole uh, uh, whole economy and network industry what is particularly interesting in in times like this here is that network industries are typically critical infrastructures that's what you see today okay uh, i try to nevertheless give my lecture and hopefully I, uh, I do it in a uh, satisfactory way. And uh, I think it's even uh, rather interesting to give it this way. Hopefully we get into a bit more uh, interaction as we have right now. But our network industries are critical infrastructure. Even in, in the corona crisis, uh, we can give uh, the lecture thanks to information and communication technology. Okay. Uh, and of course, it's important, even though we are not allowed to, to get into touch physically, uh, we don't have any problems with power supply. Uh, we have even transportation. We might even get toilet paper, okay? And there is no, no problem with our drinking water supply and sewage disposal. But all of these infrastructures are critically important to our industry. Uh, and it's interesting that uh, the, uh, the the German economics ministry already set this uh, strategy up in 2009. Okay, that was a reaction somehow uh, to a discussion that uh, a Chinese company wanted to take over, wanted to acquire 50 Hertz, which is a German uh, electricity transmission operator in, in in Brandenburg or in in north northeastern uh, German Germany, Brandenburg, Mecklenburg, Vorpommern, and so on. And the question is, is it critical and can we allow some, some foreign uh, uh, companies to own this critical infrastructure? And uh, perhaps you remember the discussion about Huawei, the, British, uh, the, the Chinese uh, mobile phone maker and mobile equipment maker. Uh, uh, yeah, this is a discussion where we should rely on that. So uh, here... Uh, Critical infrastructure is infrastructure which is uh, vital for our industry. Okay, and there are, other, of course, socio-economic services like uh, yeah, public health. Here you see is also critical. Uh, culture is also put as uh, economic. Uh, as, as critical socio-economic infrastructure, of course, that our banking system and our insurance business works is also critical. But the point is, we and I'll make even more more uh, colors hopefully what we deal with is only these basic uh, uh, th these technical infrastructures okay uh, and in particular so these are infrastructures are important uh, they are typically uh, natural monopolies that is we have a bottleneck infrastructure so we have uh, a potential for abuse of of this infra uh, of this market power which goes hand in hand with this uh, dominance and therefore they are typically uh, uh, regulated on a sector specific level and we are uh, discussing how uh, that uh, is to be done okay and of course uh, we will have probably uh, a member of a working group of the Schmalenbach Gesellschaft uh, it's called Arbeitskreis uh, Regulation, Regulierung, Working Group Regulation, where all the uh, where people from from 
Deutsche Bahn, from Deutsche Telekom, from uh, electricity and gas uh, suppliers are part of that. And we will discuss uh, what the specific uh, uh, challenges for these industries are in these times of crisis, because you might uh, ex uh, know that uh, uh, in, in, uh, investment in infrastructure is really or has been really important uh, for this crisis. So thanks to overinvestment, uh, overinvestment in quotation marks uh, by Deutsche Telekom in, in a good network infrastructure, we don't have any congestion problems right now. Hopefully we don't have and hopefully you get that uh, live stream in good quality. Okay. Uh, yeah. Having discussed or having uh, talked so long now about uh, regulation, it's perhaps uh, time to, to give uh, a, 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 a definition. Here you have one. What is economic regulation? It's a state-imposed limitation on the discretion that may be exercised by individuals or organization which is supported by the threat of sanction. So what does that mean? Okay, the Federal Network Agency tells Deutsche Telekom it can change, change, uh, charge only that and that price and uh, it can only uh, or is allowed only to take uh, one day, one business day uh, if some uh, customer wants to switch to another uh, 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 telecom provider and uh, if it takes longer they have to pay uh, some fine okay so and, and that's what you see here in particular uh, it's uh, government control of firm behavior of industries characterized by lack of competition and traditional is that uh, the national monopolies government controls means uh, control of prices controls of quality control of entry and so on and what I already or previously said already, uh, this is different from social regulation, where you speak about environmental protection, consumer protection, think of the diesel uh, scandal and so on about the health sector, about workplace uh, safety and so on. What is and what does regulation? I just check now what I want to say uh, here. Yeah, regulation, that, that's what I already told you. Uh, I'm somehow uh, providing some redundancy here. Uh, uh, regulation imposes constraints on the behavior of agents by implementing specific measures such as entry regulation, price and quality regulation and regulation of competitive conditions. So uh, administrative entry conditions, if you want to uh, run a mobile telecom network, you need uh, licenses and in particular you need a frequency spectrum uh, uh, until, say, I don't know, until 2013, I think, we didn't have uh, coaches, we didn't have far distance buses. It just was uh, forbidden to enter these industries in order to protect the railways okay so these are entry conditions and conditions surrounding natural monopolies uh, i think taxi is not a not a, a, a natural monopoly but here you also have an entry a regulation uh, to a large degree just uh, prohibiting uber from 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 entering you have uh, admission uh, to or co you control admission to 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 uh, to colleges like Studienplätze, okay. Uh, you have price regulation to prevent uh, excessive prices. Uh, you have that also in, in, in housing and the health sector. Uh, how much uh, is a mask, uh, face mask allowed to, to cost? It will be a, a discussion we will have uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in the next time. Uh, of course, price regulation in, in the uh, meaning of this course typic, uh, predic, or, or typically relates to, to these network industries like electricity, electricity price too high, or telecom prices are too high, and so on. And here uh, another uh, solution uh, to, to uh, how to regulate was to have state-owned companies. And that's still a huge discussion. Uh, should uh, should a company like Deutsche Bahn be uh, uh, privatized or should it not? Should the government provide certain services? We have a discussion of so-called 
Rekommunalisierung, that is uh, municipalities uh, deciding to provide a service on their own. Should municipalities uh, provide e broadband internet services or should uh, commercial companies do that? Okay, these are all questions we are going uh, to discuss. And I already uh, explained to a certain degree what positive and normative approach to regulation is. Uh, here just a, a, a bit more, more detail. I just have to look for time. I'm running out of time here. Uh, the normative theory for regulation is just a microeconomic field, you know, which is uh, similar to the field of, of say public finance and so on, and the question is how to optimally regulate a certain sector where a market failure arises and how to do that with market-like instruments. You know the market-like instrument from public finance, which would be a PIGU tax. Uh, the positive theory is close to public choice and a political economy approaches. Uh, here the example uh, is like you should, should you have certain rules for say say politicians or, or former regulators which prevent them from from becoming uh, or, or entering some some commercial companies way high third though uh, uh, regulated so you might think of a former german chancellor who first uh, as a chancellor promoted that gazprom uh, could could build some pipeline through the baltic sea and then he uh, became a member of the board uh, of this uh, uh, company, okay? And this again here, uh, this is like more like the positive theory again also uh, with this uh, entry regulation, why is a certain regulation? We discussed that. Here again, wh what is important about these network industries is their specific structure. This is a specific structure where you have uh, certain production chains. Uh, you have uh, so, uh, if I'm too fast, you just need to ask questions in the chat. I'm, I'm still observing the chat, and uh, so if I'm too fast, just uh, slow me down, okay? Uh, otherwise, I'm just, once I speak about regulation, I hardly can stop. Okay, yeah, so how do these production chains look like? Typically, you have really uh, a multi-level a structure, you have an upstream segment, you have a downstream segment, and you have this critical or, or essential infrastructure, which is what might be called the, the monopoly bottleneck. Monopoly bottleneck. Monopoly bottleneck. Or uh, in more, in more uh, antitrust terms, it would be the essential facility. Essential facility. Okay, I have to slow me down. Uh, the upstream, you see electricity, for instance, uh, upstream would be the power generation. You have all these uh, power plants uh, who generate uh, the, the electricity and this power, or this electricity they generate uh, has somehow uh, to get to the final customer. Okay, uh, previously we had uh, a large-scale infrastructure with large-scale uh, coal-fired power plants or nuclear power plants. Uh, they they uh, uh, fed that, uh, that electricity in, into the high-voltage uh, 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 grid of the transmission uh, system operator. In Germany, we have four transmission system operators. We will get back to that. Uh, and uh, they fed that in into the distribution network uh, of the of the cumin, uh, of, of of the municipal uh, electricity companies like Stadtwerke Gießen, and then uh, today you have a certain number of retailers who then uh, uh, provide this power supply then to the common uh, uh, to the final customer. Similar with gas. Uh, again, here you have a pipeline network. Uh, for uh, the, the far distance pipeline network, uh, like Open Grid Europe is one of the providers here, and then you have a distribution grip uh, on on the city level or, com or on a municipal air, uh, level, and then you have 
uh, the gas supply to the by the retailers to the final customers. Railways here, the upstream is a bit complicated. That's why you have the dashed lines here. You have a railway equipment, right? Like the rolling stocks, the, the, the engines, and so on. Uh, the network is then the rails and the, the net and the, the management of the rails, and you have the train services. Okay, here the train services might be provided if you go to Frankfurt by Hessische Landesbahn, way by access from Deutsche Bahn DB Netz, uh, which is the infrastructure manager. Okay, now I'm really uh, clogging my, my slide. Okay, uh, so telecoms, you also have a network, uh, you have some telecom equipment uh, uh, manufacturers and so on, and you have these uh, telephone operators like like one and one who buy here one and one would be located uh, and they buy access wholesale access from uh, the, the the telecom company postal service is a bit more complicated uh, because uh, it, it's not so clear what what the, what the infrastructure is here uh, is delivery uh, or, or is, is actually the, the more of like the bottleneck okay yeah, hopefully that was clear. Uh, here, the important point is that uh, in these network industries, you have uh, certain externalities or economies of scale. Uh, here, what is called network externalities, uh, this is not perfect, uh, these, these uh, taxonomy, that's why I wrote to be discussed here. But the point is here, first of all, uh, it states... I use the text marker now, the natural monopolies. And this is pretty much what, what I told you uh, in the previous slide, uh, just uh, in, a, in a bit more uh, specific way. You have the transmission and the distribution network in the electricity, same, same in gas. You have the rails in, in, in railways and so on. The question whether there's a bottleneck uh, facility or bottleneck infrastructure in telecoms is hugely debated. That's why the local loop here is in break it. So is there really a bottleneck infrastructure given that we have at least two uh, with, with the TV cable network now provided by Vodafone, which, which took over Unity Media and formerly Kabel Deutschland. Uh, Okay, uh, still no questions on the, on the chat, so I just move on, okay? Uh, so uh, the, the, the point is, uh, or what, what problems uh, arise here, of course, you have these natural monopolies. And that means this indirect club externalities is a strange, uh, strange term. This is more like... Uh, EOS, economies of scale and economies of scope. We will discuss that in some detail. This just means that it's cheaper uh, to provide this service to say uh, or, or within a city than within a rural area because you have more people who are connected to your uh, to your gas pipeline network and uh, so if you uh, connect say a multi-story building or a high uh, rise uh, skyscraper with, with thousands of households it's much cheaper than uh, if you have to connect uh, just single uh, just houses with, with, with uh, single families and so on. This is just a standard kind of economies of scale uh, uh, problem uh, economies of scope uh, is, is similar because it's often easier to provide, uh, for instance, in terms of telecoms, at the same time, telecom services, cable services for TV and so on. Uh, what, and, and you have all these uh, club externalities with economies of scale in all these sectors. Uh, what is interesting here in telecoms, uh, you also have what is called here these direct network externalities. That's a topic we will cover in economics of innovation. Direct externalities means just uh, the, the standard effect that it's good that or, or your, uh, your utility as a user increases the more users there are on the network. So everyone is on WhatsApp because everyone is on WhatsApp. That, that's typically much uh, the point here. And congestion. 
Of course, that's a problem which might arise, and hopefully we don't have too co much co uh, congestion right now here. Uh, if all of you would turn on their 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 video camera, probably uh, our our uh, system would break down, and that would be congestion. So even though we have a network industries, if it's overused, uh, we we get uh, a problem. Okay. Well, hopefully our st the stream still still works. Yeah. Uh, the, so that should be clear that's a problem. Uh, the point is had here, and that's related to uh, what I previously said about the critical infrastructure. These are, in a sense, uh, essential services, and that's why you often have either a so-called universal service obligation, German Universaldienstverpflichtung, or a public service obligation. Uh, Public service obligation is this, uh, there's no nice uh, uh, translation into German in terms of railway service. This this would just mean a uh, gemeinwirtschaftliche Verkehre. These are just like traffic services here in railways, uh, which are uh, paid for or procured by the government or by like uh, our uh, transport authorities, like the Rhein-Main Verkehrsverbund. Uh, in universal service obligation here uh, means uh, in, in, in terms of electricity that everyone uh, has a right to access, okay, and that you uh, that the companies have to 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 uh, guarantee that you have continuous supply. Uh, same for for gas. Uh, same for telecoms, where the question is. Uh, formerly, everyone had a right to a fixed line access uh, uh, to, to the telephone network. Right now, as everyone has a mobile phone anyway, the discussion is more where we, ha we have sufficient coverage. Uh, in in uh, postal services, currently there is a huge discovery whether, uh, uh, whether post uh, should be delivered every day, daily service, to uh, each uh, citizen. Okay, so these are also uh, political topics we also will discuss because these are other uh, topics apart from standard efficiency arguments for regulation, uh, which which matter in network industries because they are related to what is called cross subsidization and so on. So what you see, I'm raising many topics here, and of course, in the remainder or in a balance of the course, we are going to address all these questions. Hopefully, I'm I'm almost done right now. Yes, only only three more slides. Uh, yeah, here what what you have here in the next slide is just once again um, I'm just uh, being redundant uh, today. Uh, what are the models and instruments of monopoly regulation? Okay, that's what we already said. In terms of our normative approach, we would start uh, with the question. Why sh or should we have regulation? And we should have regulation if there is a market failure, uh, for instance, huge uh, uh, market power or economies of scale which lead to market power. Discrimination is another po uh, topic we are going to, to discuss later. The point is that you have economies of scale, huge economies of scale, and it's clear that every one of us should only be connected once to the gas or to the water network, not not have two or three or four uh, uh, pipeline pipes going to uh, to his own uh, facility. That's why you automatically get market power if you have only one provider. Once you have these uh, reasons for regulation, the question is how would you structure these industries? Uh, for instance, in, in uh, the UK, when we uh, liberalized uh, or we tried to privatize the railways, we vertically disintegrated the industry. That is, they uh, produced separate companies. Uh, at that time, I think it was, uh, was it British Nail? It was uh, an infrastructure company with the rails and the train operating companies. In Germany, you always had a huge discussion whether you should separate uh, DB Nets, the rail work, uh, uh, the, 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 the track company, from the train operating companies, which provide the, 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 the train services. Okay, 
this a huge discussion and the question is how should you have that for instance in a german uh, tr uh, electricity transmission network uh, these uh, 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 eon for instance had to to separate to divest uh, what is now called tenet uh, the the company running the transition transmission network Okay, once you have decided on the industry structure, you decide which uh, instruments to use for regulation. Uh, either it might be internal regulation. The most important point here is that you have, if you have a state-owned uh, enterprise, of course, it's clear that you have do not uh, necessarily have to have a regulator. Clubs would be like if you have some kind of lawyers who organize themselves or, or accountants and so on. You might have a competitive solution. We will discuss that by yardstick competition or franchise bidding. Uh, like uh, you, you procure a certain service and, and you have, uh, you have uh, several bidders of that. And the most important part we discussed in this course is e uh, external regulation with price regulation, quality regulation, and so on entry regulation. And here, uh, this is in, done in, in more detail here, direct regulation, uh, how to set the price and so on. I managed that. And indirect regulation is where you give the company a little more uh, leeway uh, to uh, set prices. You might have low powered incentive, uh, meaning that uh, if you uh, say you, I pay you, you back your plus, uh, your cost anyway, or I refund your cost, you don't have a huge incentive to uh, uh, reduce in, in, in uh, to invest in cost uh, uh, decreasing measures, and you might high powered incentive like uh, uh, say price cap regulation. We will discuss that. Final final point here I want to discuss is because then uh, this is already the slide for the next uh, 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 part here. Uh, the final point is. I mentioned this asymmetric information thing. Is asymmetric information important? Uh, does the regulator know what the costs of the regulated companies are? Here's an example from Australia, uh, from, I don't know, 2010 or so. And what you see here is, these are the different ele electricity networks uh, in Australia. Okay, And here you see what they said, what their costs will be. Okay, For instance, uh, City Power said their costs are going to be 1.16 million. The, the regulator, Australian Energy Regulator, uh, estimated that the actual costs are uh, just a little bit like 50% of that. Uh, then uh, after that, uh, uh, that announcement, they started something like a haggling on, like on, a, on an Oriental Bazaar, uh, and the network revised uh, it's proposed to 1.05 uh, uh, million, and the final decision was 830 of the regulator. So uh, the percentage reduction from the original was almost 30 percent. And what you see here, the point is, was it right? Is it really that? Is it really the cost? These 830? Is it more? And, and or or is it less? So the, the regulator will probably never know. The regulated company probably will know, but of course the regulated company has an ex incentive to inflate uh, its its cost and claim to have higher cost because that would mean higher profits. Yeah, th that's the problem we have. And uh, as I run out of time, uh, I thank you for uh, joining me uh, for this uh, first lecture. I now will be available uh, for, for further questions for some time uh, on, on, on WebEx and hopefully you return next week, uh, next week uh, on Thursday when we start with the introduction of perfect competition and monopoly. Yeah.